Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to another of these webinars or videos, I suppose, for the uh, Lancaster Centre for Mar Marketing Analytics and Forecasting. Uh, today, we're going to be talking, uh, in a sense, about an unusual topic. Now, uh, John Boylan introduced it uh, last time uh, as one of the important components of forecasting, judgment. Now, we don't tend to think of judgment as particularly uh, important. Uh, I've been working uh, in the centre since I founded it uh, ooh, 30 years ago almost, um, and slowly it's dawned on me, I'm a statistician by background, that judgment is an essential feature of that. So today's topic then is the role of judgment in forecasting, some of the methods you can use to improve it. Now you use judgment all the time, and so do we all. We make a judgment today, hopefully you won't regret it, to come to this lecture. You make a forecast, if you will, about what you'll enjoy, what you will learn. So it's very much a part of uh, the everyday behavior of people, but it's also a very much a part of the everyday behavior of pretty well all forecasters. So judgment versus quantitative methods, quantitative forecasting approaches. What are the pros and cons? I'll talk about in the second component of this talk about different methods of using judgment. Of course, we all, when we use judgment, we usually do it very, very informally, don't we? We suddenly just say, oh, well, I'll, I'll go to the lecture, I'll have a coffee, or I'll, more seriously, I'll come to a particular uh, presentation or a, uh, go to a course or do a master's degree, all these sorts of things. Um, so different methods, however, can be applied to these problems. But judgment is often very uh, suspect. You see it all the time with politicians. Uh, so I'll introduce you to some of the biases and the heuristics that are used to simplify uh, judgments, complex judgments. Some of these heuristics work quite well and some of them work extremely badly. And finally, make uh, some comments about how we could better use judgment. So that's today's agenda. So just to remind you from uh, the differences between judgment methods and uh, quantitative methods. Well, the key element of a judgmental uh, method is that it combines information informally and takes into account the subjective beliefs of individuals. So once sub subjective perceptions are important, now we may aggregate these up, we can combine them in all sorts of ways, but it's the subjective component. You can't repeat judgments in exactly the same way. Quantitative methods you are familiar with, they've got algorithmic backgrounds, they are a formal statement of a set of relationships and produce uh, pretty automatically, although there's a judgmental component even in that, uh, a forecast. So this fully statistical, apparently fully statistical forecasting method is still judgmental. A key issue in doing quantitative forecasting is sufficient quantitative information. I say quantitative, it could be qualitative, but you can, you, one way or another, you've got to categorize the information. And we have methods which uh, we've discussed very briefly, and some of these uh, videos we'll discuss in more detail, uh, extrapolative methods, just using past history and causal uh, methods. Machine learning spans these two uh, classes. Judgmental methods, typically little quantitative information. And of course, we have the, the possibility then of combining these methods. You've seen this, or if you've seen the previous video anyway, you've seen this before, but basically, if you ask people what sort of methods of forecasting they use, statistical, judgment alone, a combination of these things, you find that typically people use a combination. Now, this is survey evidence from demand planners. Demand planners are people working in most organizations, as the name suggests, who try to work out the demand for a service, the demand for a product, uh, 
I mean, uh, demand for service is important, but de demand for government uh, grants of one form or another. Pretty well every organization requires some demand planning in the short, medium term. And if you're doing strategic forecasting, but this survey information is related to uh, demand planners on, who have got a short-term focus, but they typically use a combination of a statistical method, usually these days, even these days, a simple statistical method, uh, but also combined with a judgmental component. That judgmental component might be to choose the method or alternatively, it may be to change a parameter, or finally, it may be just to change the forecast, to adjust the forecast. The key findings from these surveys is that judgmental methods are used more often, even in short-term forecasting, than statistical methods, and complex methods are actually seldom used. Um, another of these videos will discuss some of the reasons why, but basically people f find it very difficult to understand complex methods. That's the simple fact of the matter, R particularly difficult for machine le uh, learning. Now this is uh, a complicated slide uh, which tries to highlight the circumstances when judgmental methods are used. First, there's the definition of what the problem is. Judgment is extremely important. Almost all strategic forecasting is done through judgmental approaches. Uh, usually just somebody saying, I think we should do that, or I should think I should go there, that sort of thing. There's a data gathering component that follows on from the definition of the problem. And then we ask ourselves the question, is there sufficient data to use a quantitative approach? On the, on the uh, I can't work out whether it's left or right side of the tree, um, left looking at it from my perspective, uh, if you say no to sufficient data, you're forced into judgmental methods. There is no alternative. Uh, on the right side of the tree, you can develop some quantitative methods. If you can do both, you will often combine. So why is judgment used so much? Well, people tend to think, sometimes rightly, sometimes wrongly, that actually uh, we're talking about special events. A strike, very current in the UK at this point of time in, in March 2023. Uh, how does a strike affect the demand? How does it affect your staffing? But Simpler examples, a promotion campaign. Now, most companies, medium-sized manufacturing companies and retailing companies have promotions campaigns. These are extremely important, generating vast quantities of sales, additional sales beyond their baseline. Well, there's lots of promotional campaign. Can't we just use the statistics? Well, no, because every promotional campaign is seen as a special event. So judgment then can compensate for the deficiencies or the absence of historical data, but it also is often producing more acceptable forecasts. Now, here's perhaps a new and important notion that organizations uh, have their preferences for various types of forecasts. Governments like forecasts which show their good performance, don't they? That inflation is dropping, that GDP is increasing. And in fact, a government spokesman of the government before last in the UK said, well, we don't count those forecasts. Why didn't he count those forecasts? Because he didn't like them. He knew nothing about their accuracy. So a forecast is more acceptable to managers or government ministers. And complex methods, returning to that last point, complex methods are hard to understand and therefore don't have that acceptability component. They're not transparent. And a final point, the structuring of the problem needs to be often done judgmentally on the harder types of forecasting problems. 
So judgment is complementary, effectively, often to statistical approaches, a balance between the two, statistics versus judgment. There is a simple equation of exponential smoothing with some uh, extraneous causal factors, for example, uh, a promotional campaign, the X variable. But actually, we've got somebody here who's adding their judgment to it. So that is perhaps the most common approach, a balance between a statistical approach and the uh, conjurer taking rabbits out of the pap. So what about the judgmental methods? Well, the simplest then is the unstructured, where essentially a single expert, or often a non-expert to be honest, makes a statement about the future. Think of the politicians you know. They're forever predicting the future. Uh, so a single expert unaided by any modeling, any formality. We may have a group of experts a uh, group opinion, and that, of course, is a very common organizational approach to forecasting. There are also a set of structured approaches. Um, I'll explain them, but basically structure requires you to decompose, look at components of the problem, try and overcome some of the deficiencies of using uh, a group of experts. Judgmental adjustment, I've uh, mentioned already, uh, based on some quantitative method, combining the two, and just a 50-50 combination, the third class. Now, what about the role of experts? Uh, there's been quite a lot of recent interesting work about the role of experts. You know, if you ask, uh, well, not ask people, but if you go back on the history of people making forecasts, they're, all, they're awful, most of them, awful. You know, pretty well, nobody predicted the, uh, the fall of the Berlin Wall in 1989. There are all sorts of examples. So what this research has done is try to identify the characteristics of people who actually got it right. The, the financial crash of 2008 is a second example. Who gets it right? Are there super forecasters, uh, talented experts? Well, it turns out, yeah, they, they are, there are that. So we try and identify as one approach, try and identify people who are better at forecasting. We, the audience will, or the, the, the watchers will know that we're probably in the class of super forecasters. Why? Because we tend to be analytic and use and look for lots of data. Surveys, popular method of forecasting. Opinion polls, uh, forecasting elections, forecasting political events. Will Brexit happen? A good question in 2015. Interestingly, most people got it wrong about Brexit in the UK. The, the average forecaster uh, said, no, Brexit's not gonna happen. And if we look, turn to the third category, betting markets, there was a betting market on whether Brexit would happen or not. Now, the, a major amount of money bet was that it would not happen. Now, if you listen, this is important. The amount of money bet was that it wouldn't happen, but the number of bettors said it would happen. And there's the distinction between the amount of money, a smaller group of people, and a large group of individuals, people who are voting, said it would happen. So the betting market got it right uh, in terms of numbers, but not in terms of money. But if you take horse racing or soccer or whatever, uh, betting markets are what's called efficient. That is to say, it's very, very hard to beat them. We could have... a a jury of experts, leading executives uh, with different responsibilities. And that's very common in, in uh, major companies who will put together the finance guy, the marketing guy, and so on to get uh, a, a forecast. Focus groups. Uh, John Boylan mentioned focus groups last time, but it's not really a forecasting method. It shouldn't be 
treat it as a uh, forecasting method. What is it? It's a group of a people having a discussion. But the aim is not to get a consensus forecast like some of the others, but to explore an issue, a topic, and try and understand the dimensions of that topic. So it's very questionable uh, used as a forecasting tool. It is often used by television or uh, television interviewers as a forecasting tool. And finally, and perhaps more, uh, more obvious really, if we want to know how much we're selling, we can ask the people in the field, the sales force, and they will tell us. So those are the instructions. But here's some difficulties. Identifying who the experts are, choosing who the group of experts. Notice the example, the Brexit example. Different groups gave different forecasts. And each of the groups have biases. So the rich betters were biased towards rejecting Brexit, the population were positive about Brexit and voted in favour. So those biases uh, were illustrative of why some of the forecasts went wrong. So let's look at the alternative to unstructured forecasting. Uh, structured methods, the whole set of methods there, and I'm going to talk very briefly um, let me take the second point, decomposition, because I, that's really quite an important aspect of judgmental forecasting. Take a complex forecasting problem where you would study, what job you would take. Let's decompose that into the salary, the location, the prospects for promotion. So you would decompose the problem into the different bits. So. Analogies, often used. In fact, it almost has to be used for new products. There's not much alternative on new events. Delphi, well, it's, a con it's contrast with a committee and role playing, an interesting, particularly present, an interesting idea. So let's talk briefly about some of these. Analogies, what you do is try, try and identify historically past events past similar products. I've got an example here. You can see that uh, evocative piece of lipstick at the bottom. Um, so a project we did uh, for a company. It was uh, the cosmetic companies have many, many new product launches. They're not very new product, a new lipstick, different color, different package or whatever, but uh, they do it all the time. So the way they forecast was to look at how similar this lipstick is to previous lipsticks and how that sold. So they, I don't know how you measure the uh, uh, lipstick. Color is an obvious, but there are packaging, there are various, various, categories that you would look to similar products, similarly with promotions or political events. So for example, if you want to forecast the 2024 uh, US presidential election, uh, awful thought really. If you want to forecast that, you could look at the previous presidential elections and look what it the forthcoming election looks like compared with previous elections. A word about scenarios. Uh, J John Boylan mentioned scenarios as a, a judgmental method, and it, it is in a way, but the aim here is to understand the uncertainty in a situation. So a scenario then is a story. There's a formal definition in front of you, a consistent trends, their dependencies and so on. The method aims to forecast outcomes and their consequences, but a scenario in itself is not a forecast. It generates, you don't talk about one scenario, you talk about three scenarios, four scenarios to generate, look at the extremes. What happens if things go wrong? What happens if things go right? Think of it, in terms of the war in Russia and Ukraine. Uh, but that wasn't used as a formal forecasting technique uh, with the uh, disastrous consequences. But a scenario is not a forecast. It's based on forecasts, 
uh, population trends, energy prices, all sorts of things. So it's based on forecasts. But what it does is bring together these different individual component forecasts, some of which will be judgmental, some of which will be statistical. For example, uh, the demographic forecasts, which underlay, underlay many, many uh, situations. So if you're a company, the demographic forecast uh, 10 years out will tell you something about the demand for your products uh, with, in the UK or many countries, an aging population. So the aim then with scenarios is to capture the key uncertainties. So um, the final topic then is role playing. Role playing is an interesting one. It's been used for many, many years, of course, particularly by the military of pretty well every, every major com country where essentially different individuals or groups of individuals are asked to play out the roles. So again, I'll use the, the uh, Ukraine war as an example. So one group can play Russia, one group can play uh, Ukraine, one group can play the EU, one group plays the US. Uh, I'm sure there are many other actors they're called in this situation and they play it dynamically. So one decision is made by a group and many of you will have played computer games which have this component which actually are based on the notion of role playing which has been around well probably 150 years. So individuals take on these different roles or groups of individuals to play out dynamically the effects of say climate change or something like that. Finally, an easy one, uh, or not, not finally, a, a new topic really, of combining models with judgment. Because I've already argued that models have some positive features, judgment has some positive features. Adjustment, adjusting a statistical model is only good when you have new information to add to the model. Why is that? Because statistics is the best approach to actually uh, analyzing data to take out the noise, to identify patterns such as seasonality. If you do it unnecessarily, it will, uh, it will have negative consequences. An average, a simple average, you make a judgment, and here we've got a statistical forecast, do it 50-50. Does that work? Well, it's not bad, actually. And um, part of the reason is people overweight their own personal judgmental forecasts. But it's not advisable to modify a statistical model unless you bring new information. And this is because there are many heuristics and biases that actually affect uh, the way people make judgment. It's, uh, it's a topic of a many courses in psychology, a fascinating topic, but so I can only give you the flavor of that here. Ideas, availability, what you, what you do when you're making a judgmental forecast is you grab information. And what information do you grab? The available information, the available memory, memorable information. So this produces many pretty bad forecast because the available memorable information is not the typical information. You also anchor on the most recent memorable piece of information, the most recent uh, information that has come across your desk. And also you try and look at stories, representative information, and try and match the representative information. The final classes are not straight, they're biases over optimism. We're op optimistic. It's sometimes argued that uh, uh, pessimists are always actually more psychologically stable. Do you know why that is? Because uh, they always win. If things turn out badly, they're right. And if things turn out well, well, they're happy because things have turned out well. So pessimists. Uh, but in fact, we are typically all of us optimists. Uh, and in organizational settings, there are more motivational biases which affect us. And the final point I want to make is that we're overconfident. We think we're making our judgments and that they're correct. 
So we're always, uh, you, you can almost certainly, <laughs> I'm doing it again, you see, I'm making the same mistake. You can almost certainly say that your forecast is uh, wrong and it's wrong more extremely than you would suggest. So let me just give you a representative example before I move on to the conclusions. Uh, representativeness. Here's you've got a statistical series. Uh, what the typical person will do forecasting this series, and these will be demand planners, people who are nominally expert, is to actually just look at the last few uh, data points on the one hand. They'll anchor on what's just happened. And then th what they'll do is they'll see a lot of fluctuations in the series. So they'll try and produce forecasts which have the same pattern in the data. But that pattern is noise. And in fact, in our uh, projects that we've done for companies, we found companies that have insisted that we put a pattern in the data, even when it made things more accurate. And that's because the pattern is noise. You can't forecast noise. We can overcome uh, aspects of the problems that judgment has by using a forecasting support system, which is a, a computer-based system, which has uh, data added into it, statistical modeling features, and it integrates with management judgment. So it take, <coughs> the, the forecasting support systems which exist in organizations then have people on the one hand, data and statistical methods. Uh, and we're going to, in a, a subsequent uh, video, talk about these support systems. So it's a, a, I just touch on it to say one important approach to overcoming the inadequacies of judgment and the inadequacies of statistical models is to combine them in a forecasting support system. So how would I summarize this? How best to make judgments? Well, all things being equal, which they seldom are, Statistical methods are superior to judgment. But experts, forecasters, will typically possess information not included in the model. So what do we do? We, first, we need to structure expert forecasts. We want then to combine judgment with the statistical forecasts. We do have to integrate them correctly. So my overall message Yes, judgment is valuable, judgment is necessary, but you need to use structured approaches to the inclusion of judgment. And this looks to the, uh, one of the forthcoming webinars which are concerned with combining through forecasting support systems. If you want to learn more about these uh, approaches and the center's activities, you can uh, contact us directly, you've got the details there. And uh, I, I personally would recommend you read the chapter on judgment in Principles of Business Forecasting, which has much more detail on all the ideas I've been presenting today. Thank you. Thank you all.